Hello, I'm Jerry Mintz, Director of the Alternative Education Resource Organization. The theme of this Aero Conference is Finding the Catalyst for the Education Revolution. Aero's mission is to make empowering, learner-centered education possible for children everywhere. We here all know that children are natural learners, that the traditional system doesn't work for millions of children, and that learner-centered education does work. Our problem has been to find a way to get the word out to millions of people that there is another way. He has brought the idea of learner-centered education to a vastly greater audience. We are very fortunate, and it is my great privilege tonight to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, so, uh, it really is a pleasure to be here, and, and not least because, as Jerry said, um, the things that I talk about are represented here in the room. I knew Americans got irony. When I came across that legislation, no child left behind. <laughs> because whoever thought of that title gets irony, don't they? Because, because it's leaving millions of children behind. Now, I can see that's not a very attractive name for legislation. Millions of children left behind, I can see that. <laughs> I can see it's a branding issue, you know. It's called brand management. What's the plan, Mr. President? Well, we propose to leave millions of children behind, and, and here's the strategy, and it's perfect. It's actually perfect. It's devastating an entire generation. You know, it, it's going beautifully. But it's worth asking why, you see, because uh, No Child Left Behind was put together by thoughtful people with good intentions, I imagine. And, and if you read uh, the ESEA, it's full of... Uh, you know, important statements about economic growth and uh, realizing the talents of our children and so on and facing the future. It's all full of good things. Uh, it's just that the problem is in the strategy, in the implementation of it. It's what, what the Act requires people to do uh, or strongly uh, propose they should do if they don't want to uh, be in breach of the protocol. Um, and where it falls down is, is that it contradicts these principles that I want to tell you about and just elaborate. I say, for me, the, these issues are global in character and also deeply personal. And, but they come out of a conviction about the nature of what it is to be a human being and how we evolve. Now, the work I've been doing in these, is in these three areas, over a long time now, it turns out, kind of resolves itself into these themes. The first theme is this, that we are living in times of revolution. Now, I say that knowing full well that human life has seldom been quiet and undisturbed. I mean, the, you know, the 18th century was fairly hectic when it came to revolutions. Uh, and then we had the Industrial Revolution in the 18th and 19th centuries. Then there were the Communist Revolutions. And, yeah, and we can go on. We're in the, uh, but now we're, I think, I think um, it's reasonable to say that whatever else has happened in the past, we face challenges now which are of a different character, that they are different in scope and in implication. And I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple of words about that. My second big theme is that if we're to meet this revolution, and of course this is the, what's built into Arrow's title, if we're to meet it, we have to think differently about ourselves and our children. And the third theme is if we're able to do that, we have to act differently. There's no point thinking differently and doing the same thing. Being in your element is more than being good at something. I know lots of people who are good at things they don't really care for. To be in your element, you have to love it. And if you love something you're good at, well, you never work again. And I believe we all have that capacity and potential. It's what the element's about. So the principles seem to me to come to this. The principles of transformation are, firstly, diversity. Education has got to cherish the diversity of individual talent. And what we have at the moment in most cases is not an emphasis on diversity, but on uniformity, on finding out whether kids can do these things, and if they can't do those things, the conclusion is very often they're just not very smart. When the truth is, you may be smart in a multitude of different ways, but if the opportunity doesn't come up to discover the things you're good at or love, you may conclude you're just not very good at anything. And very many people do conclude that. So one of the principles of education has got to be to implement 
a rigorous process of cherishing diversity. Um, the second principle, though, is creativity. Creativity, to me, is the natural mode of humanity. You see, when I said that we have created these problems, we have. You see, in, very, in most respects, we're like the rest of life on Earth, aren't we? In most respects, we are natural creatures born of the planet. Uh, we are perishable, and indeed do perish. And our lives are short, and uh, in many ways, uh, dependent on each other, just as we're dependent on the rest of the environment. But in one respect, we're different from the rest of life on Earth. But it's a really important respect, I think, because it's changed everything. We have powerful imaginations. Now, imagination isn't a single power, it's an amalgam of capacities that we have. But I can describe it this way. Imagination is the ability to bring to mind things that aren't present to our senses. I mean, with imagination, you can revisit the past. Indeed, you have a past. Uh, it's the root of historical study. And what history teaches is that the past is not settled. It's not a closed account. It's a vibrant, fertile place that's open to constant reinterpretation. With imagination, you can visit other people's point of view. You can empathize with their life. You can empathize with how they see and feel things. It's not coincidental that in times of conflict, the very first thing that we aim to do, or leaders aim to do for us, is to suppress our empathy for the people that we oppose, to see them as not like us at all, and not having the feelings we would have. And it's only when you suppress empathy that you can do things to other people that are literally unimaginable. Um, if you can imagine other people's situations, empathy flows from that capacity. With imagination, you can visit the future. I don't believe you can predict it very comfortably. Some things you can, not in the human field, in the non-human field you can, uh, or in the inert field, but not in, um, not in human affairs. It's, it's almost impossible to predict the future because culture is too complex. Creativity is a step on. Creativity is putting your imagination to work. It's, so to speak, applied imagination. And... It accounts, I think, for almost everything that's distinctively human. You see, I'm not saying, if you've got a dog, I'm not saying your dog has no imagination. I don't know, I don't know your dog. Um, but dogs generally don't, I think. And, and other, other species don't in anything like the degree to which we do. It's why, from a cultural point of view, uh, other species are pretty much stagnated in evolutionary terms, aren't they? I mean, you don't have to keep checking in with dogs, do you, to see what the latest thing is? Like, What's new with you people? You know, not much really. I mean, it's just we're, we're doing what we always did, frankly. You know. Is that a tree? And <laughs> would you excuse me? You know, dogs may get depressed. They may, you know, but they, they don't listen to Radiohead, do they? And <laughs> drink Jack Daniels and stare out the window with a half open book of Camus on their shoulders, you know, things. You, know, you don't go to your dog and say, do you want to go for a walk? And it says, no. <laughs> I'm not in the mood. You go. You go. You know. <laughs> I'll, I'll stay here. I'm not. In the... See you when you get back. You see, we do all that stuff because we have powerful imaginations. We anticipate. But and indeed, all the ways in which we've now created these extraordinarily complex cultures in which we live, are the consequence of human creativity. The problem is, I think, that we have not yet seen far enough. And this is not the point in the evolution of our lives or of our species to give up on our creative powers. We literally cannot afford education systems that suppress the very powers we need to see us into the future. And in place of creativity, in most schools, we have a culture of compliance, um, of the one right answer. So we have a system based on uniformity um, and on compliance. But there's a third, in, in place of diversity and creativity, but there's a third principle, which is this. Our education systems are based on the principle of linearity, that you can predict. Uh, you can do supply and demand thinking in schools. And if we know anything about our lives, they are not linear. Are they? I mean, truthfully, did you anticipate the life you're having now, when you were 15? Did you? Could you have written your resume in advance, really? You see, you don't get your resume with your birth certificate, do you? <laughs> you know, you're given the birth certificate, you earn your resume. And most people's resumes are a work of fiction. Aren't they? A very practiced work of fiction. At the very least, they're highly selective. 
you know, on two sides, you put down some key dates and put some words in bold and italic to represent this life you've had to impress future employers. Uh, and the whole premise of it is that you have been following a preordained plan that you sorted out when you were young. Because what you don't want to do is to give the impression to prospective employers of the actual chaos you've been living through. <laughs> you, know, you, you write your resume retrospectively to rationalise the foolishness that has been your life so far. <laughs> but you see, everyone's resume is different, and the reason is that we create our life. The reason I say your life is unique is because it is, because you made it so. You created your life with the choices you've made, the circumstances you've responded to, and the paths that you've taken. Everybody's life is a composition. It's a kind of conversation between your disposition and your circumstances. And you compose your life as you go. It's an unfolding creative act. And it's not over until it is. And if you can create it, you can recreate it. The problem in education is that we are educating children almost to lose control of their own biographies. And the way you regain control is to understand the depth of your own talents, what makes you unique, and the strengths that lie within you that can be evolved and developed. So, when we talk about transformation, I think it has to be a complete transformation. It has to be based on those principles, not the ones that currently dominate. And it has implications in these two ways. That our aim has to be to personalize education and to customize it, not to make it impersonal and uniform. And there are several areas in which that has to play out. One of them is in the way we think of curriculum. Most curricula in education are desperately narrow and rigid. Uh, so what I'm arguing for has big implications for the curriculum. Secondly, it has big implications for teaching. Teaching, in my view, is an art form. And great teachers understand that. They understand their job is not to teach disciplines, it's to teach students. And half of what teachers have to know is the artistry of pedagogy. And it's what gets lost in a standardized curriculum where the artistry is replaced by this dead language of delivery and of customizing. So it's big, there are big implications for pedagogy. The third area in which my arguments, I think, have to be played out is in assessment uh, and how we judge. We might talk a bit more about that. And the fourth area is in the culture of schools. Culture, to me, is just what I want to end up here with. Culture is an absolutely critical term. Culture is an organic term. And our lives, when I say they're not linear, they're not. They are organic because we are organic creatures. One of the people I interviewed for The Element is a great guy called Bart Connor. Do any of you know Bart Connor? Uh, I know Bart very well, and he knows I talk about him in public now, so it's okay. <laughs> but Bart Connor lives in Norman, Oklahoma. And he was born in Morton Grove, Illinois. <clears throat> when Bart was, I think, eight, uh, I was, it's either six or eight, he discovered something really peculiar. He discovered that he could walk on his hands as easily as he could walk on his feet. Now, he can't remember how he discovered this, but he did. And he said it wasn't really much use to anybody, but he was in constant demand socially. <laughs> and then he discovered he could walk up and down stairs on his hands as easily as on his feet. Well, again, it wasn't much use, but it got him out of a night. And but then he said when he was 10, his mother, who'd been thinking about this, spoke to the school. And with their support, they took him to the local gymnastics center in Morton Grove, Illinois. And Bart said to me, he said, I will never forget the feeling I had when I walked through the door of that gymnasium. I said, what was it? He said it was magical. It was like a mixture of Santa's house and Disneyland. I said, why? In what way? He said, well, there were wall bars, there were ropes, there were trampolines, there were vaulting horses, trapezes, rings. He said it was intoxicating. Now, it's an interesting word, isn't it? I mean, I mean, is that true of you? I mean, do you find it intoxicating to go into a gymnasium? Some of you might, not all of you, I imagine. You know, I mean, I don't, to be honest. I mean, on the contrary, I need to get intoxicated if I am... <laughs> if I spend more than five minutes in the gymnasium, but... 
Anyway, he loved it, you see. He was good at it, and he loved it. And he went every day, or as often as he could. And eight years later, he walked onto the mat at the Montreal Olympics, representing the United States in the male gymnastics team. He went on to be the most decorated male gymnast in American history. Uh, he lives now in Norman, Oklahoma. He's married to Nadia Comaneci. You remember her, don't you? The first perfect 10 in women's gymnastics. They have a wonderful little boy called Dylan, after Bob Dylan. Why not Bob? <laughs> the thing is, I just want to make two quick points and then stop. The first is this, that none of that would have happened if Bart's mother hadn't encouraged him. You could rewind the entire movie and none of it would have happened if Bart's mother had instead said to Bart, Bart, <coughs> will you stop it with the hands thing? <coughs> no, we are over it with the hands thing. You're 10, stand up straight, like everybody else. But she didn't. She encouraged him. Now, the thing is, you see, if it was just about Bart, it would be interesting, but not necessarily significant to you. But the point I want to make is that we do that all the time. We say to children, metaphorically, stop it with the hands thing. Whatever it happens to be in their case, it could be doodling, it could be playing an instrument, it could be playing with Lego, it could be uh, working with animals, wanting to be outdoors, you know, whatever it is that drives their energy and gets their spirit lifted. If it doesn't fit the curriculum, we're apt to say it doesn't matter. And institutionally, we do it as soon as we narrow the curriculum, we standardize everything, we are saying institutionally, stop it with the hands thing unless this is your hands thing, the thing that we approve of. We crush diversity implicitly in the choices we make to narrow the school curriculum. And in doing so, we waste huge unknown amounts of human talent and possibility. The second thing, though, is organic creatures flourish in certain conditions and they shrivel in other conditions. I see it all the time. <clears throat> I went recently to a meeting of alternative education programs in LA. There are a dozen or so represented, all very different. They're all there to get kids back with the program, kids who've dropped out of school, uh, in their case. Um, they're all different, but what they had in common was they were highly personalized, directed to these individuals. There was a strong group element. There was a lot of practical work, a lot of project work, strong links with the community. Uh, a great atmosphere where they were learning of encouragement and, and positive um, direction and respect and support for the teachers. And what interests me is that's called alternative education. <laughs> if that were education, there would be no need for the alternative. But it is the way things currently stand. The good news, I think, is this, that some of the conditions that have created our challenges will create the opportunities to resolve them. I do think that the new technologies, which are transforming things so much, have enormous, currently untapped potential for the transformation of education, for personalizing it, not on their own, but in concert with other changes. We shouldn't resist them, we should embrace them. Secondly, I think the revolution is already happening. Not just because you're here, but because all around the world, people are trying to change the model and are succeeding in doing it. They're pushing against political resistance, that's true, but that will have to stop. Some, somehow. In the end, you see, when I say it's a cultural process, an organic one, change happens from the ground up. It's not for nothing we talk about grassroots movements. It's when the ground is fertile for change, it begins to happen. What happens typically in terms of times of revolution or paradigm shift is that the people who are children of the old model often cling to it tenaciously and say, that it's the only way we can save ourselves to reinstate the old model and keep it straight. And the problem is just we're not doing it properly. Let's just do it better than we used to. The future always lies with people who see the alternative and start to move towards it. And revolutions, and I think you're part of it, don't need permission. They don't come from the top. We don't need politicians to lead the way. They always come from the bottom. And eventually, politicians who've got any sense will tune into it and say it was their idea and encourage it, and that's fine. But I don't think you should be in any doubt that you're part of a movement. Uh, it may feel lonely. Uh, revolutions do until people start to act together. But there is a shift here, and it's global in character. And it will, in the end, have to prevail. 
because it's feeding off the energy of our children and it's feeding off the unrest and anxiety of parents who are looking for the alternative. And that's what we need to provide them with. We need to show them what the alternative looks like and exactly how it works. You know, there was a great quote from a poet called Anais Nin. Do you know her? She used an organic metaphor. Uh, she wrote a, a short poem called Risk. It's only four lines. But she said, this is the poem, uh, there came a time when the risk of remaining tight in a bud was greater than the risk it took to blossom. I think it's a beautiful way to put it, that the effort of constraining talent is greater and the price we pay is higher than the effort of releasing and cultivating it. And even when we release it and cultivate it, we can't predict the future, but we will release a harvest of possibilities that we'll eventually, I think, be able to benefit from. When I moved here, uh, I obviously started to study a bit more about American history, and I got very interested in Benjamin Franklin. He was a ra remarkable figure. But Benjamin Franklin once said, there are three sorts of people. Those who are immovable, those who are movable, and those who move. And you know exactly what he means. You have them in your own life, in your own institutions. There are people who just don't get it. They're part of the old model. They don't want to change. They've had it. They've changed as much as they're going to. They're just going to cling to the past as hard as they can. My advice is don't waste too much time on them. You can spend all your life knocking your head against a brick wall. It's not a very productive thing to do. If you can walk around it better, you know, it's like rocks in a river. Eventually, the rocks, you know, the water just flows around them, and it may erode it eventually. Um, there are people who are movable, who are open to the possibility. They've got that there's a problem. They would like to know what the alternative really looks like, and they're the people we should work with. But there are people who move, and they're the people who get the job done. And if enough people move, then there is a movement, and this is part of it. And you should be, I think, reassured that you're moving in the right direction, and the direction is both into our hearts and into the future. Thank you.